Okay, welcome everyone to the second annual Knowledge for Prevention Symposium. My name is Catherine Bailey Avedy, and I am the Director of Research and Learning at the Dallaire Institute for Children, Peace and Security. We are located at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. At the Dallaire Institute, our vision is a world where the recruitment and use of children in violence is unthinkable. We advocate that by prioritizing the protection of children within the broader international peace and security agenda, we are ultimately creating the conditions for lasting and sustainable peace. This symposium is part of a broader project called Knowledge for Prevention, where we're developing an early warning system focused on the recruitment of children as soldiers to lead to early and preventative action. The complexities that surround the issue of children, peace and security requires us to work together and we're inspired to see so many valued partners, colleagues and friends joining us this week. In particular, we would like to sincerely thank Bruce McKean, who has been a supporter of this project, our main supporter of this project, and to thank the Government of Canada for your continued support as well. Today is day three of five of our symposium focused on children, peace and security. And we've been joined by colleagues from all over the globe to consider how to enhance prevention and protection mechanisms for, and most importantly, with children. Today, we will turn our attention to the interconnections between the Women, Peace and Security Agenda and the Children, Peace and Security Agenda to learn how to forge a more effective pathway forward, a pathway that prioritizes children's rights up front. This past pathway must also prioritize the participation and leadership of children. And in so doing, I would like to repeat an important statement from one of our youth speakers, Aubrey Cedar, who stated that kids know the most about what they're going through and they know the most about their needs. Protecting the future requires us to listen to young people. It also requires us to better understand gendered power dynamics, recognizing first, that women and girls have an equal right to take part in peace negotiations, peace building, and reconstruction, and that these practices and processes will be more successful if this right is respected. Understanding gendered power dynamics involves recognizing the dynamics between men and women, boys and girls, and the social norms and rules that shape these relations. Power and gender are central in the context of children affected by armed violence. For instance, we know that both boys and girls are impacted greatly by violence. However, girls are disproportionately impacted by conflict-related sexual violence. Additionally, the narrative of children recruited and used as soldiers almost exclusively focuses on boys, often resulting in the invisibility of girls. In relation to the prevention of the recruitment and use of children in violence, we have much to learn about how gender influences vulnerabilities and protections. In fact, at the Dallaire Institute, we are in the process of conducting research to explore how gender influences child protection and the prevention of recruitment in order to improve peacekeeping practice and policy. We must better recognize and understand and act on gender dynamics of recruitment and use of children. This requires us to challenge normalizations of violence, such as transitions from childhood to adulthood that encourage violent act. To recognize that domestic abuse and violence can contribute to the recruitment of girls and prevent their demobilization and reintegration. And to acknowledge that gender inequality is systematic and deeply compounds the experiences of girls and gender minority children in conflict and fragile environments. Preventing the recruitment of children requires us to better understand the similarities and the differences in peace practices of men and women. Women's involvement in peacekeeping and peace building is being increasingly recognized as an indispensable component of any armed conflicts. And yet, rhetorical commitment to meaningful inclusion of women in peace processes, their actual participation is greatly lacking in most contexts. Transforming this requires real commitment in regional, national, and community-based contexts. Women's leadership in peace building has been documented and observed globally throughout history. Now is the time to realize and actualize the potential of equal participation. 
This October marks the 20th anniversary of the adoption of the UN Security Council 1325 on Women, Peace and Security, a milestone reaffirming the critical role that women play in the prevention and resolution of conflicts as part of peace processes, negotiations, peacekeeping milestones, and in post-conflict reconstruction. 20 years on, this panel will reflect on the advances made around the women, peace, and security agenda, and where limitations and barriers to inclusion still impede progress in this field. As part of the discussion, the panel will also consider how gender can be mainstreamed across peacekeeping missions and recognized as an essential piece to protecting children. This is the context for our discussion today. We are joined by four incredible individuals to help us explore these themes and unpack children's roles in agency and international peace and security. I'm now truly pleased to introduce our first speaker, Jacqueline O'Neill. Jacqueline O'Neill is Canada's first ambassador for women, peace and security. Appointed by the Prime Minister in June 2019, her primary role is to advise ministers of foreign affairs, defense, and numerous other departments engaged in implementing Canada's National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security. Previously, Ambassador O'Neill was president of the Institute for Inclusive Security, a US-based organization that increased the inclusion of women in peace negotiations and related processes, including the reform of police and military institutions. Over 13 years at Inclusive Security, she supported the creation of national strategies and policy frameworks for more than 30 countries NATO, the OSCE, and the United Nations. She also worked directly with coalitions of women leaders in Canada, South Sudan, Sudan, Pakistan, and beyond. Prior to that, Ambassador O'Neill worked at the United Nations Peacekeeping Mission in Sudan and at Khartoum's Afad University for Women. Along with former Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire, she has helped found the Romeo Dallaire Child Soldiers Initiative to eliminate the use of children during conflict. She was also a policy advisor to Canada's Secretary of State for the Asia Pacific region. And most recently, Ambassador O'Neill was a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center's Canada Institute, an adjunct professor at Georgetown University, and a member of the Board of Directors of the Canadian International Council. Ambassador O'Neill, we are truly honored to have you join us, and the floor is now yours. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, thanks for convening us. Thank you, General Dallaire, for getting together this great group. Basilika, Alice, Noelli, I can't wait to hear from each of you. And greetings to everybody watching uh, today. Greetings from Ottawa. I have uh, long been a huge fan of the Dallaire Institute and the groundbreaking work that you do. And I would do just about anything for General Dallaire himself and anyone he's associated with, given the formative role that he's played in my own life. But the women, peace and security and the children, peace and security are also just so deeply related. We have so many similar goals, similar tactics, so, more, so many lessons to exchange and ways to collaborate. It's just fantastic, I think, that we're doing this. And I've learned over years that I think part of the resistance that we all face is about power, and of course, and not wanting to give it up. But a big part is also about inertia and not really wanting to swim upstream. And we get a lot of inertia when we stay in silos. And I really commend the Dallaire Institute for bringing together a multidisciplinary group, so military communities, human rights advocates, sports leaders, academics, et cetera, uh, young people. Thank God you're bringing together young people. This is just how we need to evolve the way that we work. So I wanted to reflect a little bit today about how women, peace and security is evolving, especially as it relates to women in the security sector, and share some thoughts on ways that the women, peace and security and children, peace and security agendas can be strengthened by working together. So I came to my current job, as you mentioned, Catherine, after about 15 years of an, as an advocate and trying to get more women meaningfully involved in every aspect of peace and security. And I focused a lot on how women's inclusion leads to better outcomes, including operational effectiveness in the security sector. And I had, as I do now, you know, tons of examples, anecdotes, vignettes, data, et cetera. I happily did research and documented experiences, and we talked about women enhancing situational awareness. So male and female villagers being more open with women in uniform about their priorities or local threats 
including the threat of recruitment or abduction by children of armed groups or by armed groups. Uh, stories about women increasing the public's confidence in security forces, often believing them to be less likely to be corrupt, or women being less likely to use excessive force, thereby saving lives, reputations, and even money from lawsuits against forces. And maybe as a function of, of getting older or getting a bit tired of hearing myself, um, I'm, I now have a little bit of a different reaction to the, as I call it, the why women question. So obviously we need to understand gender dynamics, exactly as Catherine just described so well. But the question is often still framed as, you know, what do women bring to peace processes? And I'm getting a little prickly about that one, I think, maybe for a number of reasons. One is that we've shared a lot of data and that hasn't always led to behavioral change. I think we're often offering it in good faith and sometimes it's actually asked for, people say we need evidence. I realize in part because they wanna put off action. The majority not, but some people I think are saying we need more evidence in part because they wanna delay or put off action. Another reason is sample sizes are just so small and they're still collected within systems that are overwhelmingly male. And yet people expect transformational change from a very, very small percentage of women. So, we're ignoring sometimes the basic concept of critical mass. You have 3% of your military personnel on deployment sometimes in missions who are women, but we're asking for evidence of what they did to improve the impact of that battalion, for example. You know, it often represents an acceptance that women have to prove more, that they can do more than just the job that they were hired to do. So they have to explain what, in addition to doing the job well, they did additionally. Uh, and sometimes I think that takes the burden off men to be competent at the full range of tasks that are needed. And as many of us know, I think it's led sometimes to frustration and resentment among many in uniform, because some of the justification given about why gender or why women is based on stereotypes, often rooted in truth, uh, especially about women as mothers. And many women in uniform worry that that undermines their professionalism. And of course, this relates deeply to children, peace and security, because while many women in uniform want to work directly on pre preventing recruitment of children, supporting their demobilization, etc., many are worried about being pigeonholed in that space. And the, you know, the idealist in me really wants to flip that question every time someone asks it. I want to now say, you know, we know that diversity generally leads to better decision making. We know that women are capable of performing the most difficult jobs. And we know that our peacekeeping missions in particular overall have major challenges in effectiveness, including in actually protecting children. And we need to significantly involve their capacities to deal with the changing nature of conflicts. So why is the burden not shifted to say to all of you institutions that still have major barriers, cultural, organization, whatever, how can you justify still having them in place? Why are you not spending our money better and being more responsible with the lives of people that you're deploying? But really getting that, I think, requires a level of leadership at the very highest level that we're just not finding uh, in enough of a widespread manner these days. So the realist in me knows that we need to keep asking that, but also working on a number of fronts including doing research, sharing that, and really focusing on the barriers to women's full participation and on incentives for people to remove them. And one of the practical ways that I, I think we're doing that, that I'm proud of uh, within government is called the LC Initiative. And many of you uh, may have heard of it, but I'll speak to it briefly. Uh, the goal of it is to get more women in uniform in UN peace operations. The idea being that the pace of change is just unacceptably slow. Uh, rates of, uh, are a little bit better for police than for military, but overall the rate of uniformed women in the UN has hovered below 5% for a very long time. So Canada launched the LC initiative named after a woman who was Canada's first woman to become an aer aeronautical engineer in 1929, Elsie McGill. And it has a few components, including training and technical assistance for one or two police and troop contributing countries, a fund to provide incentives or assistance to troop and police contributing countries to deploy women peacekeepers, and a research and monitoring and evaluation function. And the idea is that we wanna support countries to identify barriers that actually exist for women to be recruited, retained, deployed, and redeployed. And so 
Uh, we've identified, and with partnership of an organization called DECAF, uh, 14 barriers that women face in this sector. And I'm going to name them because I think each one is important. And they vary in importance in each context, uh, but they're strikingly similar across areas. So one is a lack of information on deployment opportunities, just not knowing what is available. Two is corruption in deployment selections within their own forces. Three is women seen, being seen as needing protection rather than as potential protectors by senior leaders. We still hear that they're not sent on some of the most dangerous uh, patrols, for example. Four is years of uh, requested experience for deployment. So generally it's five years or around the time that women he hit peak childbearing time. Five, physical fitness tests and whether or not they're actually suited to the jobs they're meant to do. Six, the UN minimum criteria for deployment. For example, the need to be able to drive a, a stick, uh, a manual transmission is something that women aren't often brought in to do. Seven is women are often ostracized within training cohorts. Eight is inadequate accommodation or facilities and equipment, both in training or at back at home, including on deployment. Lack of specific medical care on deployment. It's nine. Ten is lack of adequate family friendly policies. Eleven, and we hear this everywhere, is sexual and gender based violence and harassment. Twelve is unequal opportunities in deployment and missed opportunities at home. 13 is unreasonable expectations uh, to do this extra amount of work. And actually 14 is the lack of support networks. So our idea is that we, we hope we can tackle these barriers uh, based on what's most important in any context. So to wrap up, I just wanna share a couple quick thoughts on the eve of this 20th anniversary of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda about, about where I see some real synergies with the children, peace and security movement. And as I've said in a few, or as I've heard speakers say in a few previous sessions, what people are clamoring for now, for now generally in both of our, our areas, women, peace and security, and children, peace and security, is not new normative frameworks. Uh, so women, peace and security now has 10 resolutions. We have 84 countries with national action plans. We have the NATO, the African Union, and may, many others have, have policies and strategies. The real focus has to be on implementation. And there are a few areas where our push on implementation is very directly aligned. One is this focus on prevention, as you're doing through this initiative. I think we're still getting the balance totally wrong on prevention versus response. We need more child-centered early warning indicators and more gender-specific early warning indicators. And of course, those indicators don't mean much if we're not serious about response as well. Second is we must keep focusing on involving education and training, again, as the in Institute is doing. It's really, really difficult to deal with the UN Special Envoy or Commander who went to the top school, got the best education in his stream, and introduced the concept of women, peace, and security, or gender, and say it's really core to every aspect of your mandate, but none of the elite educators you've had to date in your career have really ever raised it. Uh, and I know that that's a core part of this initiative is, um, you know, dealing with training centers and getting into curricula, exercises, simulations, et cetera. And the last one I'd say is really seizing windows that are brought about by two simultaneous and major dynamics that we're all experiencing. So one is the pandemic, of course, an evolving understanding of security. The fact that all the guns and tanks in the world were not relevant when we had a, a health crisis spreading around the world. Uh, and that's, I think, led to an appreciation for gender and other forms of disaggregated data, as well as awareness of the massive prevalence of violence that many people experience in their own homes. And the second is the Black Lives Matter movement. We have a heightened awareness about systemic racism in institutions and international architectures and the way that that can shape all of our actions and responses. And I think these are just to cover just a few of the ways that the children, peace and security and women, peace and security uh, areas of focus can really coordinate. So I'll stop there and happy to have more conversation afterwards. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. We really appreciate your collaboration over the years and your continued engagement with the Dallaire Institute. You've raised so many important points about accountability and leadership and 
questions we need to ask about who's creating the rules and how we're, how we're making assumptions about best practice when not everyone is around the table to inform the measurements in the first place. And so I, I really look forward to further discussing many of your comments later on in our, in our time together. So thank you. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Baslika Joan Lado, who's joining us from the EVE Women's Development Organization in Juba, South Sudan. Baslika graduated from the United States International University with a Bachelor's of Arts in International Relations with a concentration in Diplomacy and a minor in Business Management and Sociology. Baslika is one of the representatives of the Africa Youth Advisory Board on D DRR, where she is the focal person for enhancing disaster preparedness for effective response, including recovery, rehabilitation, and reconstruction. She is also engaged in the Africa Youth Front on the coronavirus. She has worked with the African Union Youth Volunteer Corps, the EVE Organization for Women's Development, Children and Youth Empowerment South Sudan, as well as Community Service in Solidarity Child Rescue Center in Nairobi. I was actually fortunate enough to work with Bezlika in Juba um, over the past year to advance our collaborative uh, efforts to talk about how the Women, Peace and Security Agenda and Children, Peace come together. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing your remarks. So the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Bazlika Joan. I think the introduction has been done. I'll just go straight to the PowerPoint presentation. I'll start with brief introduction of Eve organization, and then I'll go to, uh, to discuss about uh, women uh, involvement in the peace uh, process in South Sudan. And then I'll go to discuss about the role of young people and how young people have also um, been participating in peace and security in South Sudan. And uh, we'll go to the questions and answers. So if you have any question for me, that will be your chance and I'll be ready to answer them. We can start. Okay. Um, sorry. Our EVE Organization for Women Development was established in, 20, in 2005 in Sudan and in 2008 in South Sudan. Its head office of the head office of EVE Organization is in Juba, South Sudan, and it operates in five states, which is Central, Eastern, Western, uh, Equatorial states, Western Barakazal, Jongole state. Um, and these states were selected based on EVE organization interest of engaging with women from different regions of South Sudan and developing a strategic stronghold to address the challenges facing the women in South Sudan. The mission and the vision for EVE organization, the vision is a peaceful and empowered women in South Sudan. And the mission is to strive to improve the quality of life of South Sudanese women and girls through processes and intervention that help them realize their full potential and an effect and effect positive changes and values in their communities. Mm. So um, I just wanted to highlight uh, some of the ch challenges that are affecting women in South Sudan. And uh, some of them are inadequate representation and participation of women in decision making. Uh, as um, most of us know, or at least some of us know, uh, South Sudan is a new nation and it's been going through different uh, conflicts. And uh, because of that, uh, the level of representation of women in decision making is very low. So um, most of the women in South Sudan, um, they want to, um, they, they are working towards uh, equality and equity in participation of women in all uh, institu institutions and governments in South Sudan. And then domestic sexual and uh, gender-based violence against girls. Um, there are some cultures in South Sudan that are practicing some uh, cultures. Uh, it's, it's a, there are some cultures, yes. Um, there are some practices that, that they practice, like early child marriage. You find there some in some traditions. 
someone, a girl who is 13 or 12 or 14, 15, she's ready for marriage. And then, um, so th these are some of the challenges that uh, people in South Sudan are going through. And then lack of uh, social economic opportunities for development of entrepreneurship skills for the survival of women, education and health challenges for women and girls in South Sudan, limited support from local community and government to support women and girls to realize their full potential. Uh, so these, these are some of Eve's practical um, work that Eve has been doing since uh, its establishment in 2005. So uh, Eve was a signatory to the revitalized agreement on resolution of conflict in South Sudan on behalf of South Sudan Women's Coalition for Peace. Uh, during the Sudan election in 2010 and South Sudan referendum in 2011, Eve organization mobilized women, women to turn out for election in large numbers. A uh, key in advocacy for women and peace, peace uh, peace and security under the framework of the UN SCR 1325 and related resolution. The development of South Sudan U UN SCR 1325 National uh, Action Plan and the integration of gender aspects in the New Deal Compact. Uh, mobilize women to participate in the 2014 to 2018 IGAD led. Um, South Sudan peace process and the representation, uh, represent, representative of women in the revitalized joint monitoring and evaluation commission. Uh, before I go to the role of women in the peace process, I just wanted uh, to mention that uh, the executive director of the organization, Ms. Rita Lupidia, Lupidia was awarded uh, the the United States Institute for, uh, for Peace uh, awarded her the Peace Prize for this year. So women all over South Sudan are celebrating her right now and we are celebrating the women of South Sudan as well because they all worked collectively. So the role of South Sudanese women in the peace process, they advocated for inclusivity, as I mentioned earlier in the challenges, and then raise women issues at the table. Um, from the conflicts in South Sudan, women were mostly affected because some of the male, uh, some of the brothers, and uh, we're talking about child soldiers, you find some of the kids were recruited even as, child, as, as soldiers at a very young age. So women really suffered from that. Some of them lost their husbands and there are practical examples on there. There are even women right now who are still telling their stories about how their children were taken and even their husbands had gone for war and they ended up without kids and without a husband. So women were really affected during the conflict. So right now is an opportunity for women to raise these issues at the table so they can be addressed and then escalate tensions among the parties. So during the negotiation process uh, between the opposition and the government, the women in South Sudan had to really stand strong to escalate the tensions between the two. So they can come together and sit and agree on signing the peace process. And this uh, led to what the women in South Sudan being one of the signat signatories in the peace agreement. Uh, women were signatories in the peace agreement and then advocate for education and health rights of girls, uh, of women and girls. Uh, education and uh, health is also some of the challenges that we are still going through. So you've, uh, there are some institutions that are still um, not very stable and like the education and there are also some uh, cultural practices where girls are not allowed to go to school or there are some health practices where they are not considered serious conditions and these girls instead of going to seek for uh, treatment from hospitals they are advised to stay home or um, it's uh, so women are advocating for education and health rights of women and girls and then enhancing the capacity of young women leaders to effectively participate in decision making. So that's where I come in. If organization is also enhancing the capacity of young women like myself and young and many others, uh, so they can effectively participate in decision making. 
uh, it has done that through different uh, programs. Uh, it had an incubator program where it recruited young mothers, uh, young graduates and trained them. And then uh, on uh, entrepreneurship skills and among other things, so they can go out and um, make something out of themselves. And then uh, there was a volunteer program also, uh, especially for young girls who were graduates and did not have employment opportunities. So they had a, a volunteer program with EVE organizations and some were deployed to primary schools and orphanages among other uh, places. So they can go uh, uh, to learn from those as well as to give back to the community. Okay. Women representation in the negotiation. So women in South Sudan were uh, there in the in the peace negotiation process. There were women in political parties that participated. Women in civil uh, in civil society and youth. The women in the South Sudan Women Coalition. Uh, that is where Eva was, became the signatory. The South Sudan block. The, South, the women block of South Sudan are faith-based groups and then academia. And then uh, to the role of young women, the young South Sudanese women in the peace process, uh, young women right now, most of them are advocates for peace. Uh, some of them are doing it through art, music, drama, uh, giving strong high uh, spotlights to challenges that young people in South Sudan are facing. So you find the artists that draw some of this and then there are musicians that compose songs addressing some of these challenges. And then they're doing that in different languages uh, so the information can reach out to all people, including those in the grassroots. And then because of the limited space for youth participation, young women have conducted radio discussion to address these challenges. Uh, there are different radio programs all over South Sudan where it's addressing uh, youth issues and the, mainly um, advocating for youth representation in all uh, institutions as well as in government positions. And then empowerment and uh, building, pro uh, building programs for youth, for young girls to address issues like early marriage and forced marriages. As I had mentioned earlier, there are some practices or cultural practices that are being carried on like forced marriages for young people, for young girls, and then also early marriages among others. So there are so many young people in South Sudan right now that are addressing these issues and giving a spotlight to them all over social media. And they're really using their platforms to address some of these challenges. Uh, just, I just took from, uh, the river, uh, took from the revitalized agreement on resolution of conflict. I took from chapter one some of the benefits that the women in South Sudan gained from the peace agreement, which was the 35 women representation in the government. So South Sudan right now is going through a period where they are, they is a, they are forming the government. And uh, we have formed the national government and now we are going to the state government. So from the revitalized peace agreement, there were specific uh, numbers that were allocated to women. And then the national diversity and gender, that is Article 1.4.6. And then Article 1.5.2.4, women vice president to be nominated from the former detainees. And right now that has been implemented uh, among the vice presidents in South Sudan. One of them is a lady. And then Article 1.14.3, national legislation deputy speaker, that has also been uh, national legislation, okay. And then uh, Article 1.14.5, uh, Council of States Deputy Speaker from the opposition to be also a lady. So thank you very much. Um, for more information about EVE organization, you can follow the EVE Facebook page and their official website as well. Uh, there are so many updates about what is going on in South Sudan as well as the revitalized peace agreement. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you Pesnika, for that very informative presentation. And I had the opportunity again to witness Beslika and her colleagues at EVE do some incredible work, very creative and innovative ways to engage community in peace action. So again, I look forward to continuing our discussion later on in this session. 
I also want to highlight that Bezlika is one of five youth speakers and change makers who are joining us for this symposium. And so we're very, very honored to have young people voicing their concerns and their perspectives. And so thank you again, Bezlika. Thank you so much for having us. So next, it's my pleasure to introduce to you um, Alice Yuroso Kerkesi, who's joining us from the Center for Conflict Management at the University of Rwanda. Alice has 20 years experience working in post-conflict settings on issues of women's rights and gender-based violence, regional peace and security, and transitional justice. Her career includes legal work in law firms and as a law professor. As a gender and security expert, Alice's more recent assignments include the drafting of a civil society gender strategy for the furthering of Rwandan women's political participation and influence as part of the government of Rwanda's implementation plan of the United Nations Security Council 1325. She has also led numerous expert trainings focusing on the protection of women's rights against sexual and gender-based violence. Since 2013, Alice has collaborated with sub-regional organizations, the Eastern African Standby Force and the East African Community, and at the invitation of the Rwandan Defense Forces as an expert on gender, peace and security, on issues of civil military cooperation in the context of the creation of an African peace and security architecture. She is currently completing her PhD project with the School of Global Studies at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. And it's a pleasure to have you with us and the floor is yours, Alice. Thank you very much, moderator Catherine, uh, for hosting us. Warm well, greetings everyone from Kigali. Uh, before I go to my uh, brief remarks, let me uh, first of all thank the organizers and in particular the Dalea Foundation for associating me with to this important event. In Rwanda, the name of General Dallaire is closely associated to, to us. It belongs to all. As a peace and conflict researcher, I noticed almost all his visits at home, especially because he's often hosted by uh, Yakinama, that uh, Rwanda Defense uh, College, where my center also provides classes in uh, uh, security studies. I could never forget when I saw him testifying in the case of Akayesu as an expert witness in 1998 in Arusha. General, I salute your tireless work, uh, including through the establishment of uh, this particular organization here, uh, showing uh, the consistency in your idea and your, your, your tireless work for uh, uh, the right of uh, children and uh, people generally. Uh, I want also uh, uh, to warmly greet uh, now Ambassador Jacqueline that I had the pleasure to uh, get acquainted with at the, um, at the Institute of Inclusive Security uh, while doing the work that has been highlighted by the moderator. Um, uh, since then, I want to congratulate her for her new work. It is a true pleasure to reconnect, reconnect uh, Ambassador Jacqueline. Greetings to Basilica, greetings to all of you who are attending this session. Um, I, I think uh, to complete what uh, the predecessors have, have done, have spoken about, I'm going to uh, focus my remarks briefly on the questions of barrier to the inclusion of women and how to overcome certain of the, the barriers. Uh, my experience uh, of uh, those uh, two issues that I want to highlight come from uh, um, theoretical parts because uh, at the Center for Conflict Management, we teach about those issues. But uh, here we take mostly my heart as a field person. And when I'm speaking about field, uh, is uh, uh, speaking uh, about the experience as an advocate, first of all, but also um, the work I've been doing uh, of evaluating the work of the Rwanda government on uh, the uh, implementation of 1325, as well as uh, uh, helping uh, propose a new, a new um, framework of national action plan that Ambassador Jacqueline as a vote. 
But uh, even more importantly, when it comes to the peace support operations, I'm going to speak from the lenses of somebody who since 2013 has been involved uh, in uh, kind of pre-deployment trainings. Uh, those uh, familiar with them will recognize that uh, there's this uh, field training operations uh, and um, uh, that are organized in the framework of uh, the African Union architecture in peace and security. Um, in the last uh, 15 to 10 years, uh, different sub-regional organizations, uh, including the East Africa um, uh, forces, the five countries, the contingent, and also the Eastern Africa uh, standby force that uh, include 10 countries. So uh, include those of, um, of uh, East Africa, plus others like South Sudan, Seychelles, etc., Ethiopia, etc. So, um, but also I participated uh, in other organizations uh, trainings that included uh, non-African forces like the American forces, the Dutch forces, etc. So, in these uh, uh, um, venues, uh, my role has been twofold. Uh, we simulated uh, real, real life peace support operations and uh, I've been invited both as uh, somebody who uh, helps streamline uh, the position of uh, head of civilian uh, in the, those uh, trainings, but as well as um, a, a gender advisor. Uh, perhaps to give you uh, an idea, the setup is uh, often being in a military camp that uh, is taken as a field support operation in real life, having contingents from countries uh, and having within these contingents civilians, military and police, and more and more also uh, detention uh, uh, officers. The point is, uh, based on the scenario, I think uh, people would, uh, would know those who are familiar with uh, the Karana scenario, etc., would, would recognize. So, based on um, a fictional uh, situation of crisis and focusing on certain themes, we'll try to see how we respond to that. So, we'll really play the role as if we were in real life uh, with evaluation all the time. Uh, those exercises uh, are run uh, during uh, five, six to ten days fully. You are in a situation, you are placed in a situation, and you try to respond as if you are, you are there. And um, first of all, uh, I don't need to, to, to remind you that in those uh, contexts, women are a minority. Uh, and uh, children are not there, but uh, the issues is you have a setup that is uh, mainly military in nature because we operate in, um, in a camp, uh, in a military camp. Uh, in those military camps uh, are supposed to reflect what you have in real life. Uh, and uh, as a civilian and as a woman, you are a minority in those setup. So it has been uh, um, interesting to learn how, what, what are the dynamics there and how to operate. And what's taking my heart now of a, a, a university lecturer reflects on how do you do it? Because as activists, as an advocate, uh, it has been easy from a normative point of view to argue why we should have uh, uh, many women included there. Uh, and uh, although it has taken years of implementation, although it has taken a lot of effort, um, a lot of steps have been uh, taken. And I realized how seriously uh, 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 participants in those audiences 
how, when it is explained to them that we are discussing frameworks that have been adopted by states, mm -hmm, which uh, they states, the particular state and the African Union are, are, are trying to conform to. So I realize how much conceptually it is important to explain and to, to learn to, how to find a word to explain that. So, uh, uh, um, meaning there is a pedagogical uh, aspect of it. First of all, the shock I realize counterparts have in real life when we are uh, operating in those cities. Much as, as a civilian and a woman, I realize how few we are in those uh, setup. I realize how puzzled some of them are to see us there. So one of the way I wanted to help address the barrier was to explain. I realize how little people understand that in the way the way these support operations are thought of after situations as uh, Somali, Somalia and Rwanda, there has been a shift in terms of how we conceptualize peace and making peace in those situations. I realized particularly recently when I was uh, in Tanga in Tanzania in the framework of uh, East Africa, uh, uh, um, Operation, the field training exercise, I realized that when we were doing what they call clinics, meaning the seminars you do before starting to simulate the peace support operations, I've been requested to speak about the role of civilians there. And I took a great deal of trying to explain how after the Cold War and after experiences such as Somalia and Rwanda, the whole aspect of uh, 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 peace work, uh, 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 peace and peace support operation has been shifting from the one we knew after the World War II. And I was puzzled myself to realize how little mm, they knew about that and how it started making sense. After my presentation, I, I, I had conversations with uh, uh, those among the, the high ranked, uh, uh, the camels who are there, they were asking me, oh, uh -huh, we learned something because we didn't know, that's why, because we were wondering why you came to this operation. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that for them, it was supposed to be uh, uh, military most mostly. So uh, I want to summarize this point by saying uh, we should not uh, 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 underestimate the conceptual barrier. Once we secure uh, 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 based on our normative work of why the, it should be like that, we need to do something more and take up the explanation or the conceptual uh, aspect. Um, the other, uh, um, the other uh, point, the, 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 the other, um, the, the other aspect that uh, can look controversial because I've been doing a lot of advocacy work, as Jacqueline was uh, mentioning, when I was much younger. I thought that uh, we should push, push. And I, I did my share of pushing. But I realized that at the end of the day, you have to try to find the easiest way to translate your good ideas into concrete art. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and sometimes, while you put effort, uh, you may, you may, may be mis misled, mis misled on that. Because I took interest um, to understand better what the civilians and women, for that matter, who are also in these operations, 
think. And the civilian institutions that are supposed to pursue this, uh, 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 this push for more and more women in peace support operations. So that's, I learned also a big, a, a big deal of things uh, by doing that. Uh, first of all, I observe uh, how um, not only the civilians and women felt misplaced while being in those operations and how they reacted to that. You have to understand that uh, uh, most of the time, uh, people who go and participate in those uh, uh, exercises are recommended by member states because most of the time it's interstate effort, so they are recommended by uh, member states. In the case of Rwanda, uh, this effort was done by uh, the Ministry of Defense. In many organizations, in many other states, they were coming, uh, they were sending mostly civilians working in the ministries of defense, or it was the ministries of foreign affairs uh, sending them. So uh, I'm going to, to go quickly. Um, but when they realized that, uh, um, the, the institutions, the civilian institutions, didn't feel very much that it was their business to do so because they still believe it is a military thing, but also civilians did not make so much effort to understand the process. My own, my own uh, uh, approach uh, was, uh, I'm a minority here, how do I adapt? And I behave in a way, first of all, to understand the, the, the logic of the organization I was there in, and to try to bring, to, 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 to add value while being there. It ended up with uh, 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 the, the colleagues telling me, can you uh, 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 help us recruit more civilians and more women like you? What I did when uh, I was asked, so for many years, from uh, 2013, to 20, at least uh, 16, 17, uh, I was proposing names of those who could go to, 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 to training for that. But uh, perhaps to summarize here, uh, one, the barriers, uh, institutionals, the patriarchy, we, we know all that, but some other barriers uh, uh, come from the way uh, we conceptualize this support operation of the time. And the, to understand how women can be, can add value there. So I believe it is not only the role of uh, 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 countries to enforce the frameworks, but it's also uh, 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 women and women groups, as well as uh, 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 institutions that roles like uh, the one of Jacqueline, that should streamline and be aggressive about doing that. I emphasize also the role of training, understanding. And uh, when I was discussing with uh, Catherine and the other colleagues from uh, uh, the Lea Foundation, I told them that it would be a good time now to develop trainings of civilians and women who will be able to understand the most what is requested here and how they can add value. By going there and having the frameworks, it will be a bit easier to have people add value, women add value in those organizations and who uh, uh, can be able to influence those who are the pillars of uh, the peace support operations, meaning the uniform people. Uh, thank you for your patience. I'm going to uh, uh, close for the moment and uh, hoping to have more questions to explain what I want to explain. Thank you, Catherine. Great. 
Thank you very much, Alice. You've raised many important points about even our different our different dialogues and in, in from a civilian and security sector, the different ways that we communicate and the different concepts that we understand and the importance of the understanding each other's perspective and how we work together. And, and I don't, we don't spend enough time doing that work. And I think we'd be more efficient and effective and collaborative if we did that. So I, I really appreciate that point that you've raised. So next, it is my great pleasure to introduce our final speaker. Noella Martinez Franchi, who is the Director of Multilateral Affairs and the WPS Focal Point for Uruguay. A career diplomat, she joined the Foreign Service of Uruguay in 2002 and has served in the Embassy of Uruguay in Buenos Aires and Council General of Uruguay in Barcelona. She has a master's degree in public policy and development and a degree in international studies. Noella, we're really thrilled to have you here with us and I look forward to, to hearing your, your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Katherine. Hello everyone, greetings from Uruguay. It's a great honor for me to share this panel with such excellent panelists that have illustrated us so far in the Women, Peace and Security agenda. And a very special thanks to the Daler Institute for the invitation and for this initiative and to Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire on behalf of my country for his work and for the respect he has shown for our peacekeepers. I will focus my presentation in the implementation of Women, Peace and Security Agenda in the Americas and on how this agenda can be mainstreamed across peacekeeping, peacekeeping missions and other agendas such as children, peace and security. Let me start by saying that Uruguay is fully committed to the implementation of Women, Peace and Security Agenda which should be understood as part of the commitment of my country to multilateralism, to peacekeeping operations, and more broadly, to the promotion and protection of human rights, including all the international instruments on women and children protection. As the first Latin American country to chair this year, along with Canada, the Women, Peace and Security Focal Point Network, we recognize the important role the network plays in promoting the exchange of best practices to strengthen women participation in the security sector, in peace processes and in mediation efforts. During this co-chairmanship, we are focusing in two main aspects of the agenda, protection of women peace builders and having action-driven national action plans. And I would like to share with you that as part of this co-chairmanship in this very special year, we organized last December with Canada, a workshop called Opportunities for the Women, Peace and Security Agenda in the Americas, which really marked a turning point in how the countries of the Americas relate to this agenda. And I think this should be highlighted because we usually think of women, peace and security in, relay, in its relation with armed conflicts, but sometimes neglect its importance also in conflict prevention and peace consolidation. And the role this agenda can play in the armed forces and police in relation with their contribution with troops to UN peacekeeping missions, we all know is important. But it is also significant to integrate this agenda when we think in the security sector in general within borders. And this is particularly important for our region. We need to bear in mind that Latin America is home to 14 of the 25 countries with the highest rates of femicide in the world into the highest global rate of sexual violence against women and girls. So detaching the women, peace and security agenda from internal dimensions of violence is similar to disconnecting the human rights and security agendas, which at the end doesn't help tackling the violent realities Latin American women and girls face. The workshop in December was also important to generate greater trust and connections between civil society and military and police in the region and it also helped strengthen networks of women peace builders, mediators, peacekeepings, military and police. I would like to highlight some of the key points that were raised on the regional context. Uh, one of them, I already mentioned it, that peace and security in the Americas goes beyond the traditional notion of armed conflict that has dominated the global conversation of women, peace and security. Also, that recent incidents of violence and instability in the region point to the need to strengthen women's leadership in conflict prevention and resolution. And here again, prevention, like Jacqueline mentioned. Low levels of women's political participation is critical to address 
as it contrasts with the enormous grassroots leadership exercised by women in their communities at the local level. Women's leadership, when recognized and supported, becomes a fundamental component of any conflict prevention and sustainable peace initiative. During the workshop, we also talked about peacekeeping and observed that barriers facing women from the region in deploying to UN peace operations include gender inequality in Latin American cultures, UN standards, recruitment of women, a lack of representation and leadership, and entrenched gender roles. During the workshop, we also discussed protection of civilians as a pillar of peace operations and how the UN is adjusting its approach to engaging with civilian populations by creating engagement platforms, a gender balanced new capability to enhance peace operations by facilitating community engagement. I can delve into this later if, if we, we want to, to listen more about it. The activities developed throughout this year, this year of co-chairmanship of the network, have proven to be a unique opportunity both for increased regional cooperation and for building an America's per perspective on women, peace and security. So this is a key opportunity to build on, on good practices such as expanding existing networks of women mediators and women human rights defenders to the regional level. The transformative potential of the Women, Peace and Security agenda in Latin America should build on these entry points through new ideas and this is an opportunity to connect both Women, Peace and Security and Children, Peace and Security agendas. Now I would like to share with you that although Uruguay is very active in Women, Peace and Security agenda and is one of the top troop contributing countries to UN peacekeeping operations, we still don't have a national action plan to guide our actions and give formal structure to the policies, actions and activities that we are already implementing. So the workshop and the network, this is where the relevance of this network is shown, helped Uruguay first to generate more connections between civil society, government and security forces that are crucial for the development of the NAP. Second, it also showed us the importance to not only focus on defense and foreign initiatives, that, which of course are going to be a significant part of our NAP, but also consider domestic security challenges, such as human trafficking, migration, refugees, that should be addressed through a gender lens. And I would also like to highlight something that uh, Jacqueline mentioned, and we, it's a point we would like to address in our NAP, which is related to barriers identified in the LC Initiative Barrier Assessment Study. We know that Uruguay is one of the eight pilot countries that is uh, having this uh, barrier assessment done. Last year, 380 police officers and 380 military personnel from the three armed forces Army, Navy, and Air Force were surveyed in Uruguay in order to identify these barriers. Half of the persons inter interviewed were men and half of them were women. Some had previous experience in peacekeeping and others didn't. And although we are still waiting for the final report, some initial information brings us some light that can help us identify the main barriers that exist to increase women participation in peacekeeping. And uh, for us and for Uruguay, that is a goal to achieve because women participation impacts positively in interactions with civilians, including children. And we are convinced, and the experience shows us that, that the presence of female military peacekeeping is peacekeepers is important in all these specific interactions and at all levels. I can develop this further, but some of the Uruguayan experiences in the field prove the importance of having mixed teams deployed. And I would like to share with you the answers of one of the questions of the barrier assessment study, which really strike me, which uh, the question asked participants to indicate the main skills required for mission success. And the skill that ranked number one for respondents of all the armed forces, men and women, was the ability to communicate and to listen. It should be noted that this is a skill that is not a UN requirement for deployment, but is nevertheless related to the Uruguayans' idiosyncrasy and is undoubtedly part of the training received. And here I would like to highlight training as Alice and Jacqueline have mentioned before. So as a French peacekeeper used to tell me, a tool that has extremely been useful for him and for his team, and for his team when deployed was empathy. And women know a lot, a lot about empathy. So I would like to close my, my, 
initial remarks here by, by letting you with these, these ideas. And I am willing to, to ask any other questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noelia. That was uh, that was excellent, and you've touched on so many so many elements that I hope we can further explore. The engagement platoons, uh, of course, as a, a tangible, a concrete action, and that's challenging barriers for women's participation. I really also appreciate your final comment about empathy and how that is such a central central element of peacemaking and peace building and a, a skill that we are not explicitly developing in in people um, to to enable us to do this work better so i really appreciate that thank you so now it brings us to the opportunity to address some of the questions and thank you to our participants who have submitted questions in advance we're going to, we, we decided sort of in our virtual green room that we would have a little a bit of an informal way to, to go about answering the questions. So I'm inviting the panelists at any time if they would like to ask a question of each other to do so. Um, just to remove your, your uh, to put your video up and we'll know that you have a question. I think we'll start, there's one pressing, pressing question I think um, would be important for us to start with. So Jackie, in advance, I apologize. There's a hard, hard starting question uh, for your consideration here. But we know that one of the largest barriers for women's participation in peace building and peacekeeping is sexual violence. And so how do we, how do we do better to overcome this barrier? And what are the connections between women's experiences with sexual violence and the children, peace and security agenda as it relates to recruitment? Yeah, easy one from the start. Um, so there are, you know, like any significant issue, it has to be tackled simultaneously from a range of different fronts, right? I, I don't trust or believe anyone who says, if you just do this, this will happen because it's such a, a compilation of factors ranging from culture of organizations to, you know, pressures and, and dynamics within the deployment area to a whole range of other things. Um, I think some of the positive steps have been statements about zero tolerance. I think we need to see more, less tolerance um, of it. And I think we need to ensure that it's not only at a UN level, but at a national level consistently for everyone from, you know, Canada to every single other police and contributing country. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll note that there is, it comes up sometimes that some people will say, and you'll hear every once in a while, you know, more women in peacekeeping will likely lead to less sexual ex assault and exploitation within forces. And I think that is extremely dangerous path to go down. I think number one, we have no evidence of that. Number two, it's putting a burden on women that is not in no way should be placed on them. Uh, I think it's true that more the more deployment conditions approximate real life, I think more people will, or normal life, I should say, I think the more people will behave in ways according to um, ways that they might behave when they're not under pressure, but that in no way should, you know, we have to address the issue of sexual violence and exploitation and sexual abuse, you know, the blue on blue dynamic as we talk about that is a problem that should not be related to the proportion of women in a, in a force. And that is not one of the compelling reasons why we need more women in, in forces. Um, I think, uh, you know, another thing I'd point to is that uh, our chief of defense staff in Canada, General Vance, uh, has launched and he's made a priority over the last some five years, something that he calls Operation Honor in the Canadian Armed Forces. And it's about preventing and addressing and eliminating sexual assault within the forces. And I, I mention this because it really, the way that he articulates it, I think makes enormous sense, which is that you can't expect soldiers who are abusing and disrespecting and have, have no sense of dignity for their peers to then engage with respect and dignity and empathy with a, with a community. Um, those two are not separate divorced concepts. And so the force itself is stronger when there is a level of respect for every single individual within it. And that translates into 
engaging effectively and respectfully with local populations. So I think that's in part how it relates at least to some degree on the issue of, of child soldiers that we have to have greater respect and dignity for everyone and a greater, you know, higher standard of operation because that isn't, we can't view separately what happens within forces and the, and the way that they act within communities. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. And, and drawing from that, how are the barriers related to sexual violence that women are experiencing in peace processes? How, how do we draw lessons learned from advances we're making in the WPS agenda towards a, a children peace and security agenda in terms of preventing recruitment and sexual violence? Um, I'd love if, if colleagues jumped in on this one too. I think they've got um, great answers. You know, one of them, one of the things that's come up, of course, is the importance of leadership and the clarity of senior leadership about the his or her tolerance or lack of tolerance for it. So there's a culture of leadership that is, um, you know, one of the biggest determinants of of how people uh, function within within training or within um, other other like con instances when they're together. As we mentioned, actual consequences that people experience. Uh, and then, you know, again, going back to training, we, we have heard a fair amount about the importance of integrated training with men and women because, um, you know, in some contexts, it makes sense to have women and men trained separately for a portion, but we've also heard a lot about how um, the training needs to simulate the experience of deployment uh, more accurately, I guess, so that people are trained and, and uh, expectations are exceptionally clear in a training stage. Uh, so that when deployment occurs, there are no changes. I guess you could you could say that way. Okay, great. Thanks. And and picking up on that, Alice, you you talked also a lot about the importance of training and understanding not just men and women's experiences, but the experience of children, um, and also the civilian perspective as it connects to a security sector um, approach to, to peace building. So I'm wondering if you could um, also share your perspective on how, how does the WPS agenda and the CPS agenda come together um, in a tangible way for us to see a, a different path forward? Oh, I think you just have to unmute your, great. Thank you. Yes, uh, we, we already know that training is important. Uh, perhaps what I want to emphasize here is what's uh, 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 added goals in those trainings. Uh, I would see one goal as, uh, first of all, demystification. To demystify peace support operation as something that is done only by the uniformed people. Uh, mostly by the military, to clarify what's the role of civilians uh, uh, and with the civilians come the issue of what role women can play there, what, how uh, they add value in understanding certain issues, in preventing the, the happening of certain issues. So uh, we do training, but those trainings are very um, uh, ready-made and uh, although we have shifted from uh, a type of operation uh, uh, of uh, the, 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 the immediate aftermath of uh, World War II to the post-Cold War, but in terms of content we still bring uh, things that have to be done in a certain way. Uh, I had to get familiar with uh, the lines of operation, scheme of maneuver, and so on. So uh, when I start speaking this language, I made myself respected, and also I tried to go further with it. So I, I think there's a lot of myths. Uh, so people have uh, civilians and uh, women for that matter to understand clarity in their roles there and how they can add value. The second aspect is uh, to familiarize with this world. Uh, because uh, um, one thing that we underestimate is uh, how intimidating it can be. Uh, in my case, I was uh, operating with generals of army, uh, colonels of army, high-ranked people in the familiar sites where they are the most powerful. So you have to have the guts for that. 
So it means that before uh, uh, the uh, stage of uh, pre-deployment training, uh, um, those who are planned for recruit, recruitment should be familiarized with that. What does it mean? What the language to use? And what the attitude to take when you are there? Uh, uh, so to cut the long story short, training, yes, but training in addition to uh, uh, demystification of the military and uh, familiarization with issues uh, that uh, uh, can uh, be the, the realm of civilians and mostly women. Thank you, Alice. Noel, if I can turn to you, we, you talked a lot about the importance of gender equity and in action and in representation. And can you tell us a little bit about your perspective? There's a lot of, there's a, a, a consistent debate about the idea of, of lumping women and children in the same category. So it's, it's women's responsibility, as Jacqueline critiqued already, to, to take care of children. And, and I'm wondering from your experience and the design of the engagement platoons, how do you address this, this tension between women and children as, as one, one way of looking at peace and security? Thank you, Catherine. Yes, uh, it's, it's a, really, a really interesting question. I mean, we have to look at women and children as, as, as entitled with rights. And we need to listen to, to their voices, as you said in your presentation. I think that's what the Women Business and Security Agenda has fought so hard to, to really get uh, uh, women to not be considered only as victims, but also as agents of change. And I think that we can also learn from that, that the same applies to young people and to children. We, we need to take, uh, to take listen to, to their views, to their needs. And uh, I think that's, that's really important. That's why we are um, really working in these engagement platoons I, I, I spoke before, because we think that the interaction with civilians and with the communities is really important in our missions. You know, we have a long-standing experience in, in MONUSCO, in uh, DRC, and, uh, and that's like, like a laboratory for lessons learned and best practices. We have uh, there deployed a female engagement team. We thought that could help really engage with civilians, with communities, interact with them, bear in mind the protection of civilians, including children. But from our experience, um, it had a lot of positive aspects, yes, but what has proved to be the most effective uh, deployment in the field is to have mixed engagement teams. I mean, teams integrated by women, yes, in a great amount of, a great proportion of women, but also men, and all trained in this gender perspective. And I would really like to emphasize uh, training you know, from our experience, we, we have dealt with uh, sexual and exploitation and abuse cases, and training has shown to be, have proved to be a key element to prevent that from happening. And I think that applies also if we want to consider the Women, Peace and Security Agenda and the protection of civilians. We are really, really, uh, we really emphasize the training, the pre-deployment training here in Uruguay, and uh, training not only by our training school, military training school, but also civilians, the MFA uh, goes to that uh, pre-deployment um, courses. Um, we'll try to listen to different uh, perspectives of the humanitarian crisis of the environment where we are going to be deployed. And also, of course, they have all the military courses that need to be, to, to be done to, to deploy. But training is it's really important. It has proven to, to be successful in dealing with uh, sexual exploitation and abuse cases. And we are convinced that it can also help to deal with these other uh, elements and these other agendas. Well, thank you very much. Um, as an organization that focuses very heavily on training, we, we can certainly uh, relate and, and appreciate that recognition of, of the importance of training and, and preparation and planning and prevention is, that's the space where prevention is possible. And so I appreciate that very much, thank you. If I can turn to Veslika for a minute, um, 
Basilika, you talked a lot about the importance of women's inclusion in political peace processes and in community-based peacemaking and peace building. And I was wondering if you could share some of the lessons learned from your own experience and from Eve. How do we overcome some of these barriers for women to be uh, active leaders in, and participating in, in peace building? Thank you, Kathleen, again. Um, yes, sure. Um, from experience, um, some of the barriers that uh, women um, are facing and some of the barriers, especially in the context of South Sudan and some parts of Africa, um, mostly is cultural barriers. There are some cultural practices that uh, that uh, that hinder women. That, like, uh, let's say, in some there are some organizations right now that uh, advocate for Mara Sakit. Mara Sakit means you're just a woman, and um, and some stereotypes as well. There are some stereotypes where women are be women belong to the kitchen. And some of the, some of that some of these are the barriers that are hindering women uh, from participating. So you find that there are some people because they have grown up in these uh, cultural practices or because they have grown up in these cultures, it has become like uh, their reality. They do not know that they can outlive this and they can actually uh, stand up for themselves and stand up for their nation. So it has become like part of them. That's why um, as may, some of the speakers were talking about the importance of training. There are some trainings that are conducted, uh, especially uh, to raise awareness about uh, some of these things, giving strong highlight to some of these barriers that like cultural practices that uh, block women from uh, uh, participating and taking uh, their position in leadership roles, among other challenges, like um, language uh, level of literacy in some parts of South Sudan and also in some parts of Africa. Um, yeah, those are some of the barriers. Thank you very much, Mr. Keith. You expanded on, on, on exposing several barriers we, we could spend much more time talking about. From your experience at Eve, what are some of the innovative solutions to overcome these barriers? What's working? Well, what's working is the trainings. Um, Eve does a lot of advocacy training. And then, uh, as I had presented earlier about the National Action Plan. So the National Action Plan has been translated into local languages. So into most of the local languages of people in South Sudan so they can understand. So uh, there are so many trainings that are going on, uh, mostly in the grassroots area, where the organization go to reach out to these women and train them about some of these policies and some of, even uh, raise awareness as, about some of these challenges because to, as to someone it could be a challenge, but to someone it's a lifestyle they actually do not know that this is a challenge. So raise awareness about some of these issues like early marriages for young girls and even in some regional recruitment of children as child soldiers. There's some people who actually voluntarily give their children uh, as child soldiers because of poverty among other reasons. So trainings um, has been conducted to raise awareness and to uh, spotlight some of these challenges. Thank you. You're certainly speaking um, to the fact that we tend to embody, we tend to embody normalizations of violence as being normal and everyday and something that can't change. So this work of, of demystifying and challenging violence is something that we're all, we're all in the same um, path to try and, and overcome. And so I really appreciate the work that you're doing at EVE and I look forward to, to learning more. I have another question for all four of you. Um, I don't know if, if you have a preference, you'll see when the question's asked who, who may like to go first. But yesterday we talked a lot about the Children, Peace and Security agenda and how we need to come collectively together to champion the success of this agenda. 
when it comes to the women, peace and security agenda, how do we ensure that these are complementary agendas moving forward? You're interested first, first response. Jacqueline, would you like to try that first? Uh, sure. Um, I'll speak to that quickly. I, I hoped I, I tried to address that in my remarks that I think there are some real areas that are really clear alignment. One is really getting more focus on prevention. I think that's so crucial for all of us. I think we can really join, join efforts on a lot of the training reform. And so much, again, what I love about what Alice is doing and what, and what the Dallaire Institute focuses on is real applied training. Like we, I think we all are engaged so much in we say people were trained on that, which means they got like maybe 20 minutes of a couple slides on it in a section on human rights that covers many other topics. Like we really need to operationalize the training and show how it's applied and make people have reflexes about things. And, you know, I've, I've reviewed tons of simulations and, and war games where there are something like 300 actors and three of them are women. And like, that's just not, that's not real life and that's not effective training. So I think some of the approaches that we're, we're each of our movements are taking on that is, is really important. Uh, and then this whole concept of, um, of disaggregated data and making sure that, including as we look at, at early warning indicators, which is I know a big, um, big focus of, of the initiative at the moment, um, you know, I think it helps all of us to be disaggregating our data. And that's such a shared comment. I know this is much more technical than the, than the prevention issue, but going from bigger to smaller, you know, we, we have to be doing age disaggregated data, gender, disability, uh, all kinds of other ways of disaggregating gender that I think, and, and age and other factors are, are what's going to help us understand conflict much more. And they're really, really a shared priority. You know, and I think COVID is a, is a bit of a door to doing that. Like we've, we've really realized, uh, I, always, I don't say lessons learned ever, I say lessons observed because I don't think they've necessarily fed back into all of our institutions, but we are seeing collectively the whole world at a much greater level than we used to see how the same thing can affect different communities in very, very different rates and, and proportions. And, you know, women being disproportionately affected, racial minorities, racialized communities, we're, we're seeing that much more. And I think we have to, to collectively, all of us who focus on women, peace and security, ch children, peace and security, youth, et cetera, really keep pushing, and Black Lives Matter, as I mentioned, and, and uh, awareness and, and um, anti-racism to really keep pushing on getting the data up. Not that data alone is gonna change behavior, but we, we have to keep making that case. And I think that's an area where we can be collectively seizing a moment. And my colleagues in, in Meal are very excited probably on this um, session right now to hear the focus on data-driven decision-making and, and how that data is so important. And also you, you commented on how few women were engaged in simulation and we've been observing the same practice with regard to children. And so very few people are interacting with child-like simulation um, and that's something that we, we certainly can can complement in terms of changing how we learn. Can I jump in really quickly to add to what I thought was Noelle's great answer on, on women and children and, and the lumping together and I think it, it reflects a bit or it's related to what you're talking about that you know I've, I've really for a long time hated that term because it's just too uh, too blunt for lack of a better word it's it's not nuanced and obviously far too often it gets a lens of women and children are passive victims and so i think we have a real again opportunity for our movements to to work together to be saying you know number one everybody in that category has a voice uh they're not just recipients of policies um they're also providers of security right like we we either view them as kind of innocuous or victims not as people who can support security and increasingly, and I often talk about this, uh, and this tends to be one of the aha moments in, in training for many people. And Alice, I'd love to know what you find people's biggest like clicking moment is, but talking about how our adversaries are incorporating gender analysis into what they're doing. So ISIS, you know, one in five uh, fighters who left North America to join ISIS in the Middle East are women. 
Many of them are young people, so they're, and they're targeting them directly. Boko Haram, two thirds of its suicide bombers are women, and a great majority of those are children. So they're child soldiers, and they're using those because they're exploiting gender dynamics. They think women are less likely to be searched or to draw attention, or they can move freely in crowded markets. Like they're exploiting gender dynamics related to women and children that sometimes uh, others or, or many of us who are still pushing uh, to move this beyond the idea of a nice to have uh, are still not factoring necessarily significantly enough into operations. Mm, absolutely. And we, we've been observing and, and sharing the same sentiment about children. It's a strategic engagement. It's not a, an after the fact or something that hasn't been thoughtfully manipulated. And so lessons learned around the WPS agenda will and the CPS agenda in that regard would be very complimentary to see what our learnings are and hopefully they can be lessons learned in, very soon and move us from the observation. So thank you. Alice, if you'd like to respond to, to Jackie's comment uh, or question, please do. Um, just as a compliment, uh, first of all, uh, a few points uh, regarding the, the way to champion, uh, 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 to, to, to discourage uh, uh, recruitment of child soldiers. I think uh, uh, in terms of framework, we should uh, avoid to have uh, the framework of women and children lumped together uh, because it will be just like an additional to add the same way they were adding women and steer the same way they will add children and steer so it has to be a, a framework that is very clear of course the danger of those frameworks and uh, Jackie was speaking about them uh, in the beginning if you have too many you have also bureaucratization that comes with it. And with bureaucratization, it's just become a, a matter of toolkits to apply someone. And you dilute everything you've been trying to do. So we have at the same time to, to keep the advocacy parts uh, that is a non-functionary uh, uh, kind of uh, approach and as well have a framework, a basic framework to, 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 to be able to engage institution with. The, that's uh, one point I wanted to, to, stretch, uh, to stress clearly. The second one, the experience of working on, um, uh, with uh, governments on national action plan, and I uh, had opportunity also to go at the African Union for that. I realized that um, there is something that we, we don't take into consideration enough. Uh, partly, those national action plan uh, do not yield too much uh, results because of the way uh, uh, countries function themselves. We have to pay attention to the decision-making process. How in this particular country, where we are having this NAP, do uh, the, the, the decisions are made? If there's a clarity of purpose at the top leadership level, it can help. But also, how do you streamline it when you don't have that uh, 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 visionary leadership? How do you uh, uh, um, have champions within, within uh, uh, the government uh, 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 institutions to be able to push the agenda? So that's, we have tried the focal point things, they are not enough. Most of the time, focal points are focal points. Although they are there for, for mainstreaming, they are side stream themselves. So they are like units there, not doing many things. You have really to understand how uh, 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 policy making work in a given country to be able to make a difference. These are the, the um, two aspects that I, I wanted really to stress as something we have to pay attention. Um, um, now, um, on the particular aspect of uh, ch child soldiers, yes, they, if we look at one way, yes, they are strategically targeted. There's no question about that. But if I look at uh, the experience we have had in Rwanda uh, uh, of uh, popularly perpetrated genocide, when you have uh, uh, people never killed before engaging in uh, organizations, militia, and uh, also uh, ISIS, 
you, 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 they, they, they find the society and it is something we, we have to think properly how to pay attention to. Uh, recruitment is not made only because there is poverty. Recruitment is successful because there's no future. So which brings us back in the way uh, uh, um, countries, uh, if countries are impoverished too much, uh, if too many sanctions are on a country and there's no future for people, it becomes an income generating activity. It's not only mothers giving out their children, it is something you do, you get valued. You have no future, you are in a slum somewhere. You get value because you take arms, you know. Number two, you get benefits that are very concrete. So it comes as to the broader question of uh, structural factors of uh, uh, making. It's not only poverty, because when we say poverty, sometimes we address them by giving, you know. But it is no future, thinking, this is not the worst that can happen to me in my condition, mm -hmm. but it is something that will give me value. Uh, at worst, when they will demobilize, I'll get a package, you see, which is very different from just uh, being in your, uh, uh, what you say in French, don't don't bled, you know? and uh, waiting for your life being just uh, useless. So uh, 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 yes, there are things, uh, in, if we have to approach that in a very comprehensive way to understand uh, what are, how societies are structured, uh, what's the level of stress in society, uh, what are the level of hope. If the generation of my parents, they didn't have so much, but they were hoping to have better, by going to school, you see? So uh, we have to rethink when all those issues of peace come also to rethink about the global uh, 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 um, uh, uh, power dynamics and the way distribution of when people have nothing to lose, they can go to the extremes. And it's not, not only about parent and so on. When people, have something to lose, they become stakeholders of peace. Mm -hmm. That's a, a, a wonderful uh, final message. And certainly we've been talking the last two days about the importance of peace foundations and having all of the systems coming together in, in strength to create opportunity for young people and to really challenge the way that we've been working together historically and to ensure that that equity and recognition and I think Jacqueline had said you know diversity leads to better decision making so how do we create the foundation that values that and this is what we hope at the end of this week we really are, are coming to some hard questions together to think how we can how we can do this differently yeah, thank you. And, and, and Bazlika, you've also touched quite a lot on sort of the conditions for young people and what are we doing to uplift and provide opportunity that looks different. So it's not just about changing the mindset of the adults uh, who are creating the rules, but also about creating the conditions around in which we live and, and the place that children live in that. I think at this time I'll invite the panelists, if you had a a question you were really keen to ask a colleague, now would be a, a, certainly a great time to do that. Is there something you were really hoping to ask one of your, your colleagues uh, on the panel? I, I mentioned it, but I, I would love to know what, when you're doing training or when you're, you know, um, when you're speaking with colleagues, uh, when you're doing work at EVE and you're working at a community level, what do you think what are the moments that you think are the most powerful in shifting this, uh, this conceptual barrier that Alice talked about? So I think each of you has experience with that and I'd love to hear more about it. Um, I think one of the moments, uh, let me just give my experience. Uh, we recently conducted a training and um, I think one of the moments that really got me was uh, 
you know, once you go to do the training, you're just doing the training, but the feedback that you get from the women, from the community, it changes everything. It was an experience that it touched me deep as a person because uh, some of, uh, especially when they give practical examples about what they're going through and then how much they have learned from the training and how much uh, they're going, because of this training, they're going to change their entire lifestyle. So that is great for me as an individual because you have not only changed a person, but you have changed that person and you have changed their, their family and you have changed their generation. So they have learned something that they're going to carry on from their generations and they will go home and implement it. So that's one thing that really touches me from the trainings. Once you get feedback from people and most of it is life-changing um, uh, feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Noella, would you like to share? Yes. Well, after, after listening to, to Alice, to Jacqueline, to Basilica, it's so hard to, to add something different. What, what I really keep thinking on is that we, we really need to, to stop thinking in these agendas as separate agendas, and we, have to talk, we need to tackle this or that. But we really need to integrate women and children concerns and experiences in all the policies we, we develop, in, in all the programs, in all the levels. I mean, I think that, that's the way to really cross-cut these agendas and, and, and to really face uh, the, 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 the challenges we, we, we need to tackle. Uh, it's, it's integrating, mainstreaming this uh, into, into all aspects of our, our policy decision-making process. That's, that's all. Okay, thank you. I know I agree and we have much to learn from each each perspective and, and what is working and certainly we're in positions to champion each other's work in a different way and to see these synergies in ways maybe we hadn't before. So it's about that, that collaboration versus the competition, which so unfortunately is very prevalent in, in our fields um, where we're looking for the same resources to do our, our work and all of the work is good. So finding that that point of collaboration is so, so key to us being successful and helping each other be successful. I appreciate that very much. I think that we may have come to the end of our time together. And I want to sincerely thank all of you for your brilliant comments um, and remarks for pushing us to think about this issue differently, um, challenging us to do this work better moving forward and together. And certainly we, we certainly appreciate that. I just wanted to flag a couple of, of key, key points from, from my perspective, having the pleasure of, of participating with you and, and Jackie, I, I really appreciate it, your focus on implementation. We have, we have the frameworks, we have, we have many understandings and now it's time for action. And so what does that action look like? And I also appreciated you talking about changing the balance from response to prevention. And, and that's, that's where we, we're the biggest, the biggest needs are are required. Bezlika, you talked about inadequate, inadequate representation of women in peace processes and, and particularly young women. And so how do we challenge that? How do we challenge social norms that tell women your place is not in leadership when in fact we know it certainly is and that's a place women are making great change and have always made great change. So challenging that story um, to be representing the great things women have been achieving and will continue to achieve. Alice, you talked about the importance of understanding the why, why things are operating the way they are so we can have a better discussion moving forward. And, and I think that was really key for me, uh, explaining the why is important, taking the time to understand the why of the other perspective as well, so we can see where there are points of collaboration, where, maybe where we hadn't seen before. And the future, the hope. We need something to look forward to. That was very, um, very important uh, way to, to close and that your, your discussion. And it's, we, we need to do better to ensure that every child feels hopeful that their future is bright and that we're doing as adults everything we're supposed to be doing to protect that. And Noelia, yeah, I, I also really appreciate your talk, uh, your points about women's role in conflict prevention. 
I think that's so key. And, and we're, we're talking about women interjecting in themselves because the space hasn't been created. So women creating that space themselves to be there. And, and how, how do we do that work with, with more strength and more collaboration and with our colleagues uh, helping create spaces with us to do this work. So I, I really appreciate that. So I, I also want to thank all of the uh, individuals who have joined us from around the world to share in this discussion. And I, I'm confident that you're leaving with some new insights and different insights by the, the wonderful commentary from our panelists. I also want to thank a couple of our key donors who have joined us uh, for this session as well. So Jim Stanford and Susan Gibson, we thank you for your continued uh, support and for being part of the, the dialogue with us. I also I want to invite you to our session tomorrow. So we continue, this is day three of five of our Knowledge for Prevention Symposium. Tomorrow we're focusing on prevention of recruitment. So the dynamics of, of that. Our speakers will include Michelle Chiquinine, who many of you know as a very well-known author and human rights activist. Abdi Karim Hassan, who is the Protection Program Manager at the Elman Peace and Human Rights Center in Somalia. Serge Strubantz, who is the Director of the, for Europe and MENA for the Institutes for Economic and Peace. And then Dr. Shelley Whitman, the Executive Director of the Dallaire Institute. So we'll be convening tomorrow to continue our discussion about preventing recruitment of children and violence. We would like you to join us. We also extend an invitation to join our growing community of practice. We are trying to create a space where academics, policymakers, practitioners, and community members come together to share lessons observed, hopefully to collaborate towards lessons learned um, in this work. Once again, I'd like to thank our funder, Bruce McKean, who is our, our, has been supporting our Knowledge for Prevention project for, for the last couple of years. And I thank you again for joining us. Thank you sincerely to the panelists. I look forward to many, many more conversations and opportunities with you. And have a lovely day, everyone. Hopefully, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.